when it comes to games, looks aren't everything, but they are undeniably a thing. And for the most part, a game will set out to look as good as possible within the limitations of the day, where good is sometimes defined as realistic, or polished, or has very many pixels. On special occasions though, a game will go in completely the other direction, deliberately downgrading its visuals or adding some spicy so-called imperfection as a stylistic choice, and it's never not fascinating to see how that turns out. Clap your eyes on these seven times games made themselves look quote unquote bad on purpose. Enjoy and beware very minor spoilers for the following games. Thanks, Spider-Man. Wow, that is a lot of ice. Let's see what that construction worker says. A wise person once wrote, I don't know much about frame rate, but I know what I like. It was probably, let's say, Oscar Wilde. Spider-Man, you came. And as a rule, what we like about frame rate in video games is when it's nice and high, which makes movements look smooth and makes controls feel fast and responsive. Yeah. Therefore, the ultimate graphical goal might seem to be more frames per second under any circumstances. Except then how to explain how unbelievably cool Spider-Man looks in this suit, which is animated at a different, lower frame rate, on purpose, if you can believe it. This is the Into the Spider-Verse suit, as it appears in Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales. The underground must be nearby if they're hijacking that billboard. But contrary to what Andy might tell you at length, there's more to a great spider suit than which bits are red and how big the eyes are. Yeah, Andy, I said it, and you can fight me. Locking on. All right. Now to trap them down. The coolest thing about the suit is the choppy dynamic way it's animated, in contrast to the smoother, more conventional animation of the other suits. This came about when the developers at Insomniac consulted with the Into the Spider-Verse filmmakers to replicate not just the design of the suit, but also the unique style with which Miles is animated in the movie. Here's the film's production designer, Justin K. Thompson. We were able to advise on some of the unique design elements that made the film so distinct, like how we often animated the characters on twos, Animating on twos is a technique used in traditional animation, that is, not the kind in video games, where an animated element is held for two frames, not just one. This means the frames change at a lower rate, in a way that gives the artists more control over the speed and power and rhythm of the character movement. A transmitter around here. The upshot is you get this energetic, expressive animation, the distinctive choppiness of which comes from having what is technically a reduced frame rate. Totally worth it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go and prepare for my eventual fight with Andy over Spider-Man costumes. There isn't going to be a fight because I'm obviously right. The bigger the eyes, the better the costume. If I had my way, it would just be two massive eyes with legs. This again. You see what I have to deal with. I fly halfway around the world and an odd note is waiting for me in my hotel room. It says to come to the bridge down by the river. This looks like the place. Thimbleweed Park is, believe it or not, a video game from 2017. The same year, Horizon Zero Dawn was released. Specifically, it's a throwback pixel art point-and-click adventure made by one of the minds behind the original Secret of Monkey Island. Nope, one of the ones that isn't Tim Schafer. Ron Gilbert is his name. Gilbert is famous for Monkey Island, yes, but before that he created a game called Maniac Mansion, known for its multiple playable characters, its NPCs that freely roamed the house, and the fact that everyone was proportioned like a novelty bobblehead you'd find at a truck stop. A little weird Ed Edison would look so good on my dashboard. Thimbleweed Park continued this visual style but harnessed the raw power of the Xbox One to add things like colours and pixels. The result was something that captured the spirit and character of the original point-and-click game, but didn't require an emergency trip to the optometrist after every play session. Let's photograph the victim and head into town to talk to the local sheriff. The body is starting to pixelate. 
at least until you get to the ending, at which point the game appears to glitch and transports you to what's described as the wireframe world, which looks an awful lot like the rudimentary visuals of Maniac Mansion. The game is glitching! At this point, Thimbleweed Park has the same simplistic shapes, the same limited colour palette, and the same blocky fonts as games from the late 80s. Either this is a pitch-perfect tribute to the point-and-click adventures that came before, or they really lost enthusiasm for the project towards the end. Could be both. As if that wasn't enough, then it abandons all of its graphics entirely and becomes an even more old-school text adventure. Let's end this. Oh no, wait, these are the credits. Stand down. Time you met our man inside the LPD. Here's a payment for the last little job he did for us. He is understandably cautious. Get to the payphone in Torrington as quick as you can and await his instructions. Grand Theft Auto 3 was arguably the moment where the series really took off, somehow cramming an entire richly detailed city into a PS2 game. This huge achievement set the series on its path to becoming the multi-billion dollar franchise it is today. You know, Devin, the way I see it, and hey, I'm no intelligent businessman like you, but the way I see it, there's two great evils that bedevil American capitalism, the type that you practice. Back in the days of GTA 3, though, the games weren't above taking direct pot shots at the competition, as you'll discover in the mission Two-Faced Tanner. The first clue that this isn't exactly a normal mission is that your Yakuza contact Asuka describes your target as a strangely animated undercover cop. Our source in the police has informed us that one of our drivers is a strangely animated undercover cop. This fourth wall breaking comment relates to the fact that the mission name is a direct reference to hero of the driver series and undercover cop John Tanner, a character who was notoriously badly animated in Driver 2 on the PlayStation 1, released a year before this game. Catch up with Tanner and run him off the road and you'll discover that, to poke fun at Driver 2, he's been given a completely mismatched running animation, with his flailing arms totally at odds with the sharp suit he's wearing. This all seems a bit mean. Was Rockstar not satisfied creating one of the most beloved and technically impressive open worlds in all of gaming without also sticking the boot into a game that attempted the same noble task on the previous generation of consoles? Besides, the animation in Driver 2 can't have looked that bad, can it? Oh wow. Yeah, totally fair. By Driver 3 in 2004, its developer Reflections had had time to get its own back on Rockstar by including a joke character called Timmy Vermicelli. A spoof of GTA Vice City's Tommy Vercetti, Timmy is wearing a child's water wings because GTA protagonists famously drowned if they tried to swim. Now who's having the last laugh, eh? Ah, yeah, still Rockstar. The official rules of engagement in the fighting tournament depicted by Super Smash Bros have never been 100% clear. We assume such rules exist, yet incredibly don't prohibit consuming your opponent and pooping them out again. Even the Viper Randy Orton couldn't get away with that. In another embarrassing omission by the official Super Smashing rulebook, nowhere in the rules does it say that competitors have to be in possession of three spatial dimensions. Thus along came Nintendo's Mr. Game & Watch to exploit that loophole, and so we wound up with a Super Smash Bros. Challenger even flatter than my phone battery after a day spent doom-scrolling world news. <laughs> The so-called Mr. Game & Watch, if that is his real name, first appeared in Smash Bros 4 on the Wii U, and is the oldest fighter on the Super Smash Bros roster, slightly predating even venerable Grandpa Pac-Man himself. This sort of explains Mr. Game & Watch's total lack of third dimension, or texture, or bearable audio. on account of Mr. Game & Watch being rendered as he originally appeared in various games on Nintendo's early LCD handheld game devices. Except, 
Even iconically flat Pac-Man has the decency to turn up to his fight as a giant yellow sphere. What's your excuse, Mr. G? Along with being an accomplished edge guarder with a strong juggling and combo game, Mr. Game & Watch's chief combat advantage is the off-puttingly uncanny impression of him being not a physical presence, but an actual hole in the fabric of the universe itself. OP, if you ask me. Kinsey, relax. Doing my best. Look, if you're worried about me going brain dead, I figure it's part of the deal. You have to say something. What aren't you telling me? Thanks, Matt. Kinsey. It's not you she's worried about, it's everyone else. Oh, this is gonna get real exciting. It doesn't matter. I have a feeling we're about to disagree. Saving Gat is a terrible idea. The key to running a successful crime gang is to never leave anyone behind. Oh, and to have superpowers if possible. That definitely helps. Guess I'm stronger. It's the combination of the two that makes the Saints of Saints Row 4 so impressive, but the first one is the reason that, in the mission Welcome Back, you find yourself on a rescue mission heading into the brain of one of the Saints' most notable former members, Johnny Gat. I'm gonna shoot the devil in the face. Johnny, presumed dead since he got stabbed in Saints Row the Third, is in fact alive, imprisoned by alien overlord Zinyak, and living in a simulation, much like you were at the start of the game. Leave it to the Saints! Brought to you by Friendly Fryer, the only choice in home cookware. Rather than a 1950s sitcom, however, Johnny's simulation is a different kind of retro, a 1990s side-scrolling beat-em-up called Saints of Rage. In keeping with its source inspiration, Saints of Rage is also presented like a 90s side-scroller, which means deliberately blocky, low-resolution graphics and horribly compressed digitized speech. Still water. I don't remember it looking so... flat. And of course, an intro sequence where someone is kidnapped very, very slowly, while your character stands around just off-screen, doing nothing. Stage 1. Fight. What follows is a straightforward run through four stages of side-scrolling smackdowns, but we have to admire Saints Row 4's dedication to authentically making their game look like a slightly crappy 90s beat-em-up. Special shout-out to the music for its chip-tune badassery. and the fact that your character is dressed in a pixelated version of whatever you had on in the actual game itself. That is, assuming you did have anything on in the actual game itself. This is Saints Row, after all. Stage 1. Fight! Nowadays, buying a new graphics card is all about giving your PC the ability to juggle billions of polygons, apply complex pixel shaders, and accurately trace the paths of individual rays of light. Or about trying and failing to become a Bitcoin mining millionaire, obviously. Back in the early 90s, when Space Quest V was released though, getting a new graphics adapter was all about upgrading from EGA graphics to VGA graphics, thus making the thrilling leap from visuals rendered using only 16 colours to a dazzling cornucopia of 256 distinct colours. <laughs> Pretty sure I've got more than that in my jumbo carton of Crayolas, but it's not a competition. Previous games in the Space Quest series had been released in EGA, but the graphics steadily improved to VGA quality as hero Roger Wilco went from cleaning up garbage as a lowly space janitor to cleaning up garbage as the commander of a garbage cleaning spaceship. Actually, a pretty impressive career trajectory, considering how easy it is to get an instant game over in this series by, say, not adequately cleaning every last pixel of the Star Confederation crest on your ride on Roomba. Okay, but the toilet flushing sound was just cruel. Space Quest V had a neat reference to the EGA origins of the series if you had a rummage around in the fuse panel of your ship, the Eureka. 
One of the fuses is listed as VGA EGA interlock and if you pull it out the game briefly switches to EGA style graphics. How did we live like this? The irony is, Space Quest V did ship with a full EGA mode for people still playing on older machines, and its version of the joke downgraded the visuals to the even more ancient CGA graphics standard when you pulled the fuse. The only thing is, to experience this even deeper cut, you had to play a version of the game that these days looks a lot like the dying moments before a catastrophic graphics card failure. At least you didn't have to bother with the stupid crest cleaning minigame because your graphics were so bad they actually rendered it totally unplayable. Small mercies. That's right. I'm in the house. Here it comes. Extra, extra, feed all about it. The best burgers in town from all around. People from around the world come and get it. The line goes around like a merry-go-round. Not all rhythm action games require you to fill your living room with tiny plastic instruments and destroy your fragile relationships with your next-door neighbours. In fact, one of the best rhythm action games ever involved just a controller and a rapping dog who emceed his way through such daily tasks as having a driving lesson, Step on the gas, step on the gas, step on the brakes, step on the brakes, queuing for the bathroom, and of course learning karate from an onion. It's all in the mind. If you wanna test me, I'm sure you'll find the things I'll teach you. It's sure to beat you. But nevertheless, you'll get a lesson from teacher now. That game was Parappa the Rapper, which received a sequel in the early 2000s named Parappa the Rapper 2. The story in this one was that Parappa won a 100 year supply of noodles and then all the food in town started turning into noodles and it's up to Parappa to stop it by rapping and giving people haircuts and look just go with it okay? One of the things you'll also have to just go with is the fact that the sixth level of the game takes the form of a virtual reality video game called Food Court in which Parappa and his various mentors throw food at each other Pong style across a digitised tennis court. Hey, Watch out for those flying noodles, because if you don't do well here, all you get to eat are noodles. Here we go. While it might look low tech compared to the rest of the game, it's not too hard on the eyes, and if you manage to keep your rapping at an acceptable level, things stay just like this. Serve the patties. Boom, eat the grill. Rap badly, however, and the graphics will start to deliberately get worse as a visual indicator of just how terrible your rhymes are. Getting worse. French French surprise! And while this is bad, it could still definitely look even worse. And does, if you let your rapping slip into awful territory. Getting worse. Two colours. Good thing there isn't a rapping level below awful or we'd have to complete this level on a piece of paper mailed to us by the developer. Come on, kick pursue as you please. The top, top master come to your knees. There you have it, seven games that made themselves look bad on purpose. But you know what would make you look bad if you didn't click the like button and hit subscribe and also the notification button to be notified of future videos. All right, it won't make you look bad, but we do super appreciate it and it really helps out. Uh, thank you so much for watching and if you'd like to watch something else, uh, we have another couple of videos up here uh, for your viewing pleasure. Thank you, bye.